Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Joseph uh, uh, Jamit, who's a uh, professor uh, at the University of Michigan. He's a professor of Radiology. neurology, radiology, neurosurgery, ENT surgery, <laughs> and uh, oh, good, that's right there. Yeah. So uh, I I heard about about you about I don't know maybe five ten years ago. Uh, because about 20 years ago, once Dr. Louis was on vacation, he never takes a vacation, uh, but he was gone for a couple of days, and I had a patient with a really extensive leak. So I sent that patient to a friend of mine, maybe not a very good friend, because I honestly don't remember his name, but um, uh, who was in private practice in a little surgery center uh, here in Los Angeles, and uh, you know, he said, oh, that's really exciting. I'm going to do the blood patch on your patient. He's like, oh, I'm going to try to thread a catheter up the spine and then inject blood. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a really, you know, awesome, elegant way of doing it. Uh, and then he called me back like at 10 o'clock at night saying it was a total disaster. It didn't happen. Uh, he couldn't get it up more than half a level or something. And then many, many uh, years later, I found out that uh, uh, you do that all the time. Yeah, we do it all the time. And now we <laughs> finally get to meet. Is this forward right here? Uh, thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. So these are my disclosures. Um, nothing relevant to the uh, inter, uh, uh, epidural injection of blood. So the outline, basically, I'll go over a little bit of the epidural space, the anatomy, the contents, some of the measurements, which came us, which is why we decided to do this, some of the pressure. I'll go a little bit briefly about the spread of the solution in the epidural space. There's some really decent literature. And then I'll go over the multi-site epidural blood patch uh, through a single catheter axis. There is some literature, which uh, one of the prior speakers just went over. I'll go over our technique, and I'll show you two examples, and then we'll have some conclusions. So the epidural space, um, you guys all know, it's probably made up of fat. Superior, there's a fusion of the spinal and periosteal layers of the dura matter at the frame of magnum. Inferiorly, it's bonded by the sacrococcygeal ligament which I'll show some examples later how the, the contrast spreads. Anteriorly, it's a posterior longitudinal ligament, vertebral body, and the disc. And then uh, posterior, it's the ligamentum flavum, the capsule, the facet joints, and the lamina. And then laterally, it's the pedicles and intervertebral uh, foramen. Contents is basically made up of, of veins. So there's an internal uh, venous plexus with four interconnecting uh, longitudinal vessels, an anterior and posterior. And then there's an external venous plexus, which is outside the spine. And those basically communicate with the veins in the neck, the intercostal veins, azagous system, and the lumbar veins. And it's a valveless system, so it's very important that uh, blood is actually going to, if you have intracranial pressure, it's not going to be able to be localized between two valves. It'll actually go down. And then there's epidural arteries. So the majority of the arteries are located within the epidural space in the lumbar region, but they're found throughout the area. And it's majority of it is it's, it's, it's fat. So it's basically, there's fat around the sleeves of the nerve roots. Fat bus, buffers the pulsation movements of the dura sac and protects the nerves. And it facilitates the movement of the dura over the periosteum during flexion and extension. And not for us, but if you're going to inject blood or uh, drugs into the uh, epidural space, fat might have a significant uh, contribution to the pharmacokinetics of the drugs injected. And then our lymphatics actually in the epidural space. They're basically concentrated at the, the dural uh, nerve roots. So this is why we came up with this. So most of the room is in the upper thoracic spine, which we aren't going to be able to access basically under fluoroscopy because there's, you know, there's the ribs up there. A lot of patients in Michigan are super fat. They're like nice and <laughs> thin here out in California. So we can't see anything under fluoroscopy. So if you look at the adult epidural space, posterior aspect measures about 0.4 millimeters at C7, T1. The upper thoracic spine is about 7.5 millimeters, but again, we can't see because you have ribs and um, it, it's very hard to see the needle. It gets a little bit thinner down in the lower thoracic spine and it's predominantly very large in the lumbar spine. So that, that's why we decided to do this. And the other thing is the spinal cord's not down there, just, there's just nerve roots. So it's actually, I think it's a lot safer. If you look at the literature, it's about 1.5 to 2 mLs of local anesthetic to block a specific spinal segment in the epidural space. So that's how we came up with this. Like you need to inject about, you know, 2 to 2.5 mLs of blood at each level. The paravertebral space serially and contralaterally communicate with each other. So if you inject blood in the epidural space, it will go out and will communicate with the lateral and the, and the, the right and the left side. 
The epidural space is under negative pressure, except in the sacral region, so that's very, very important. The negative pressure is magnified with the patient uh, flexing, and it's reduced when they aren't flexing. The basal, vasal, the basal value is negative 1 to negative 7 centimeters of mercury, and it actually can go up if you stick the needle against the dura. And the epidural space is more negative in the sitting position versus the lateral decubitus position, especially in the thoracic region. And some people feel that you can identify the epidural space a lot better with the patient in the sitting position where the patient's hanging uh, the foot's down. So spread of solutions in the epidural space. This is another reason I, I started reviewing the literature why we decided to stick the catheter all the way up there. This is a very old study which I found in the British Journal of Anesthesiology uh, by these three guys. And they basically what they did was they, they looked at the distribution of the solution, so it was based on the volume that you injected and the site that you injected. There was no influence on the height of the patient, the rate of injection, the posture of the patient, or the age of the patient. There was wide variations in the spread of given, for a given volume for the same route. And I'll show you some examples. And they thought it was impossible to predict accurately what level will be obtained when you inject actually a drug. This is our, their diagram here. You can see where they injected 40 mLs in the lumbar region. You can see that there was wide variability where the drug went, where the, they mixed the drug with contrast where it actually went up into the, the spine here. So L2, some patients went all the way up to C3. The 20 mLs in the lumbar spine, you can see that there was a wide variability. And they actually injected caudal more in the coccyx here, and you can also see that there was a wide variability here. These are some of the examples here where they injected down in the lumbar spine. I'm sorry that the, these probably don't project well, well, where it went all the way up on both sides. This is really interesting where they injected in the coccyx, and you can see that a majority of the contrast actually went anterior to the spine here. So I think, you know, if the patient's got like a sacral leak or something like that, you might have to inject it really low. It might not go down because there, there might be some issues there. This is just another example where they injected here, and you can see that there's contrast going outside the epidural space, laterally in the paravertebral soft tissues, both sides. And they actually had a patient here, which, again, you probably couldn't do with an IRB, where they actually injected contrast. This patient was pregnant, so it was laying down. You can see that there's not as much spread. Basically, the reason why is that there's veins in the epidural space. So if the preg patient's pregnant, you're going to have increased pressure in the epidural space, the veins, so the contrast is not going to go up as high. There's an, a couple other people that have looked at this. These are the guys in Korea. They've actually published several articles about this. And they basically said that uh, they basically injected 3 mLs of contrast material through a catheter at uh, T7 to T8. And they showed that the contrast material on average goes up about uh, eight segments with 3 mLs of contrast. It usually spreads more in the cranial direction versus the caudal direction. That makes sense, too, because the epidural space up higher is a negative, so you got a pressure gradient, so you're going to push the contrast material up. And they also showed that patient's height basically uh, doesn't really, uh, if the patient's taller, it's not going to go up as far. Another uh, study that they did was posture influences. So if the patient is basically in a lateral decubitus position versus a prone position, it's going to go higher up with the lateral decubitus position versus the prone uh, distribution. So I'll get to the multi-site epidural blood patch through a single a uh, access catheter here. So this was the first, uh, this was actually wasn't the first uh, publication of this, of this technique. It was actually published in the Jap by the Japanese two years prior. I didn't actually see this. Actually, when I, when I did this, when I talked to my neurosurgeon about doing this, he thought it was crazy, to be totally honest with you. He thought I was going to cause a huge epidural hematoma. He was going to have to decompress the patient. And I said, why? I mean, we're just going to stick a four French catheter up here. We're going to do it under fluoroscopy. It shouldn't be that, that bad. We're going to put the catheter through fat, so we shouldn't really be damaging that much. So these are, we, we basically do this on every patient now. So these are the first nine patients which were reported. You can see that there's a wide variation of age. There was a mixed distribution. Majority were female. The possible site of leakage was, was, uh, was all over the place. We only really could determine the possible cause in about half the patients. And you can see a lot of the patients actually did have an orthostatic uh, headache. Some of the other ones had memory and personality just, uh, uh, problems. You can see here, a lot of these patients here had three, two to one uh, 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 procedures. One patient had five. The patient that had five was this guy that came in basically demented. He was a high-functioning CEO. He had diagnosis of spontaneous uh, intracranial hypertension. I could not solve him. I think I might have sent you, him to you, to you, Walter. I think I might have sent him to him. 
So you can see that we access usually down in the lower uh, lumbar spine, L3, L4, L2. And then we usually get the catheter up to like C5, and then we'll put like 2, down, two to 2.5 mLs at each level as we pull down. And you can see that the, the amount of blood we injected, I think on the average was 55, but you can see that some patients we got 60, one other patient we got 70. And some of the patients where we thought there was a site of leak, we would inject Duracell at there. So we would inject a fibrin glue there as, as we were pulling the catheter down. This was the, actually the first description here. This is the people uh, from, from Jap Japan. They published this in 2012 here. And they basically had five patients here. Uh, the area of leakage, again, was a mid-thoracic spine here. A lot of these patients had chronic subdural hematomas. We don't see that that much. We don't see a lot of chronic subdural hematomas with spontaneous intracranial hypertension. I don't know why. You can see here that they all had an excellent uh, response here. Majority of them, one, one they couldn't have, they didn't have really good follow-up. And then they published their subsequent series where they had 15 patients here. It's the same group uh, as the, the one that published the, the initial five. This was published in 2018. And this is, their, this is a picture from the uh, journal article here where you can actually see the sheath going into the epidural space and then the catheter. And then basically what you do is you fill the, a syringe and you pull down the catheter. And I'll show you our, our technique a little later on here. This is their results here. Um, you can see that uh, they did have one patient that had a, a, had a complication where they actually had a, a thoracic uh, epidural hematoma where the patient, uh, I can't remember, I think they had to do surgery on. You can see that the amount of blood that they injected was, was variable. It, it ranged from 20 up to as high as 85. And then this is the one complication, upper thoracic uh, ventral epidural hematoma five days after an epidural blood patch. And a majority of the symptoms actually improved. And then there's this other paper here, um, which was described. This was a case report in Asian Journal of Neuroradiology, which was published in 2015. They put a forefront sheath with a forefront catheter. However, they could not advance the catheter past the T5 test, past T6. And then they put a 2.7 French prograde catheter to C2, and then they injected about 50 mLs and then four, 41 mLs on the second uh, patch. We haven't used a 2.7 prograde catheter. We use a four French vertebral catheter, which, which I'll show you later. This is another uh, uh, publication. There's another case report uh, from the guys in, in, in uh, Canada uh, where they actually injected 120 mLs through an epidural blood catheter. So th there they went at, down at the lower lumbar, or th uh, lumbar region, went up to C, and then they actually turned the catheter reverse and went down into the sacrum. Uh, we haven't done that. So the advantages, it's a single puncture site, allows for treatment of the entire spine from, you know, C2, C3, down to the lumbar sacral region. Access in an epidural space in a lumbar region, I think, is easier than the thoracic or cervical, cervical levels, given the space, like I showed you on the prior slide. There's no possibility of puncturing the thoracic or cervical spinal cord, unless the patient's got a tether. No need for multiple needle punctures. You can also easily inject MBC glue or fibrin glue through the catheter. There's no blood gradient versus a single needle. So if you have a single needle in the epidural space when you inject, there's going to be a pressure gradient, and it, it, the pressure is going to sort of disperse as the blood goes out farther. And you're more likely, I think, to then cover the suspected leak site. Disadvantages, there's a possibility of advancing the four French catheter in the subarachnoid space, causing bleed bleeding and trauma to the spinal cord, which would not be good. Prior blood patch or surgery may make advancement of the catheter into the space difficult or impossible from scar tissue. There are some patients where it can be difficult to get the catheter through, although with a little, with a little uh, mustard, you can usually get it through. Large body habitus, sheath and catheter can buckle in the subcutaneous soft tissues. There is a learning curve. The spread of the blood may not be similar to a puncture of the epidural space at multiple levels. There's a theoretical development of an epidural abscess, and there's also a theoretical development of a symptomatic uh, epidural hematoma. So access in the epidural space, you usually, we usually insert at midline. You go through the skin, subcutaneous soft tissues, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, and then the ligament of flavum. Large body habitus can make uh, access difficult. I found this in the literature where they use a linear regression analysis to try and measure the depth into the epidural space. It was basically a linear equation where you can see that A was 17, B was this. 
and then they had the BMI, and they basically could calculate how how deep the uh, epidural space was. We usually use the loss of resistance technique, although there's several other techniques which you can see on this slide that people use. I, I don't know what everybody uses in the audience. You guys just use the least resistive technique usually. It's the simplest to use. So our technique, basically what we do is we have the patient under conscious sedation, prone. We use the local anesthesia we're going to puncture. We puncture the epidural space with a 19-gauge 2E needle at L3 usually. If you puncture down lower, it's, it's harder to angle the needle uh, so that you're going to go up the spine. We use the least resistive technique. Once we get the catheter where we think is an epidural space with the least resistive technique, we'll inject some contrast to confirm that we're in the epidural space. And then what we do is we take an angled 035 glide wire, introduce through the needle, and we advance it. We get a loop on it. We advance it up to the mid-thoracic spine. And then I'll usually put a four, I usually put a forefront sheath in. I won't put it into the epidural space, but I'll put it just anterior to the, or just so it's barely in the epidural space, because I don't, I don't like to advance the sheath in, just to give you enough support so that you can advance the catheter through the subcutaneous soft tissues, because, again, a lot of the patients in Michigan are huge. We take a forefront vertebral catheter, Bernstein catheter advanced over the wire to about the C6 level. The goal is to try and advance them to the catheter in the dorsal epidural space, and then we'll inject another additional contrast to confirm that we're in the epidural location, and then we'll do another Dyna CT to conf further confirm that the catheter is in the epidural space. And then basically what we do is then slowly withdraw the catheter, and we inject 1 to 2.5 mLs of blood at each vertebral body level. We also will sometimes inject fibrin glue or MBCA uh, through the catheter at the most suspected site of the uh, leak. So this is a, a patient here. This was, a, this was one from our, our publication. This was, a, I think, a 24-year-old medical student uh, that was having an intermittent headache uh, that got really, really bad. Uh, she couldn't study, and she was thinking about actually dropping out of medical school. And I don't know why she was sent to us. But you can see here, typical findings here, this crowding of the, of the uh, brain stem, the pituitary gland is big, there's diffuse enhancement of the meninges. We basically go in with a needle here, so you can see the needle, how it's angled towards the epidural space so that the wire will go more towards the, the thoracic cervical level versus coming in straight down. It'll, it'll be very hard to advance the needle towards the thoracic region. So that's one of the main points is you've got to advance the needle on an angle into the epidural space. This is the initial needle in. You can see that there's filling of the epidural space. Then we loop the wire here. So this is a, where we accessed here. The wire is looped. This is the glide wire. We get the catheter up into, this is like T1, uh, C7, C6. So this is where the catheter injects some more contrast. And then this is the Dyna CT confirming that we are within the epidural space. And then this is what she looked like, I, I think, uh, two to three months afterwards. Her symptoms completely resolved. This is another uh, publication which we published. This was an 81-year-old lady that they thought she was suffering from dementia. But you, you'll see from her images that she actually had spontaneous intracranial hypertension. Um, this is her MRI here. You can see that there's enhancement. She's got subdural hematomas bilaterally here. There's crowding of the, of the brain stem. Tonsils are a little low. This is her CT myelogram. So you can see there's a large diverticulum here. There's a bunch of contrast extending out. This was at uh, T1, T2. And basically what we did was we knew where she was leaking. We got the catheter up. We punctured an epidural space, advanced the catheter all the way up to, like, I think it was T1, I turned the catheter to the right side and basically injected cortis MBCA glue. So this is cortis MBCA glue, which is uh, N-butyl cyanoacrylate uh, with some lipidol. And you can see that where the site of leak is, this is all filled in nicely. And this is what her MRI looked at afterwards. So she completely went back to normal. So in conclusion, I, I basically discussed the epidural space. It's basically made up of veins, arteries, fat, and lymphatics. The adult epidural space, the posterior aspect is the largest in the upper thoracic and in the lumbar region. The epidural space is under negative pressure except in the sacrum. And then the solution of spread is basically uh, dependent on the volume, the site of injection, the position of the patient. So if the patient's in a lateral decubitus position, the spread will be greater.
Um, it's in co inversely correlated with the height of the patient. And I, I think the multi-epidural uh, blood patch through single catheter access, I showed you the literature, so there's not that much in the literature. I basically discussed our technique and I showed you two case examples.